Hey everyone, this is Dr. Celine Gounder. You may have noticed something different when you saw our show in your feed. We've been producing in sickness and in health for the last three years, but as the show has evolved, we decided it was time for a new name, one that better fits the kinds of stories we're telling. So from here on out, in sickness and in health is going to be known as American Diagnosis. New logos and art are coming soon too. We may have a new name, but some things won't change. You can still expect interesting personal stories and in-depth interviews with experts on some of the biggest health issues facing America. So please tell a friend about our show today and help us keep building this community. Okay, now here's the show. Some people call a kid at risk, but it's not a kid at risk, it's a kid that lack resources. You don't have to have a PhD to be an advocate, to serve, to be committed to quality of life efforts and issues. What are we doing on the back end to disrupt the root causes and the systems that continue to push kids in harm's way? Welcome to American Diagnosis, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. Black and Latino communities in the United States are the most impacted by gun violence. But when it comes to the national debate about gun safety or gun violence prevention, their efforts are largely overlooked. If this is the number one and number two cause of death for males, black males, 55 and under, like, why isn't anybody looking at all of this as a public health issue? In the last couple episodes, we've been talking about the state of the gun violence prevention movement and how it's gotten new energy and how for many it feels like something new. But people in these communities have been fighting gun violence in their neighborhoods for decades. It baffles me. I've been working on these issues since 1989. Despite this fact, they're often left out of the discussion when it comes to gun violence prevention. But that doesn't mean communities of color haven't been taking action. Cities United is trying to achieve a world where all of our young people grow up in communities that are safe, healthy, and hopeful. Our big goal is trying to make sure that uh, it's to reduce the homicide rate of young black men and boys uh, by 50% by the year 2025. In today's episode, we'll hear from community leaders across the country who've been fighting to make their neighborhoods safer and why we'll never fix this health crisis without them. This week on American Diagnosis, the hidden work of gun violence prevention in communities of color. Several episodes ago, we talked about a program called Ceasefire. It began as a citywide effort in Boston to reimagine gun violence prevention in the 1990s. It was wildly successful. Violent crime plummeted by almost 80%. So I want to introduce you to someone who was involved in that project, but who we didn't yet get a chance to meet. I'm Reverend Jeffrey Brown. I am currently uh, an associate pastor at the 12th Baptist Church in the Roxbury section of Boston. We'll talk more about Reverend Brown's work with Ceasefire in a minute. But first, let's go back a bit. Reverend Brown moved around a lot as a kid. His mother, Geraldine, was always his rock, a pillar of strength in his family. Well, my mother was very um, loving. She was the disciplinarian, of course. So she she was a single parent. And so she raised, you know, three boys. But my mother was the kind of person where You know, we listened to what she had to say. Geraldine had a big influence on her son's religious and political beliefs. Making sure that we were aware of who we were as young African-American men was really important for my mother. I I should also say that my mother uh, went to school uh, in North Carolina A&T College, and she was there at the same time that Jesse Jackson was there. So she was down in North Carolina um, with with the hundreds of other students who were protesting, you know, during that time. And that spirit uh, she carried into her children. 
And so, you know, among the books that we uh, were reading in our household were books about Black history, books about the Civil Rights Movement, books about Martin Luther King and, and, um, and Malcolm X. Boston is a very different city today than it was when Reverend Brown first started working there. Back then, he was a young minister in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He'd graduated from seminary just a few years before. But his time at the seminary didn't prepare him for what he saw in the streets. The violence was really a regional thing. And so it was happening all over the place. It was happening in Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, uh, Medford, uh, Lynn, Lawrence, you know, throughout the region, uh, Brockton. You had all this violence that was happening and all these guns that were showing up and these young people grabbing these guns and shooting one another. This was not the world he grew up in. So when I was growing up in the 70s, and this is like the mid to late 70s, uh, gun violence was, was a rarity. Reverend Brown was young, just 25, but kids not much younger than him were shooting each other. One night in January 1990, Reverend Brown got a call. It was the police. They said that there's been a murder near the church and you need to come. Two young men had been shot and killed near his church, Jesse McKee and Rigoberto Carrion. And I'd asked the officers, I said, well, you know, exactly what, what happened. I mean, how did this occur? These two young men were coming home, and Jesse had, I believe, an after-school job. and met up with a group of youth and then started having a conversation with them, and According to those who told me the story, they started to rob Jesse of the jacket that he had just bought. Both he and Rigoberto uh, started to fight uh, the youth, and they killed them both. But what was unique about Jesse was that he started to run away from the scene, even though he was mortally wounded. He was running up the street uh, in the direction of the church, and he died uh, some 100, 150 yards away from the church. And it was that fact that just stayed with me. Reverend Brown met with the boys' mothers. They prayed. There was a march. And I remember that march. It was freezing cold outside. I believe it was zero degrees, maybe a little below zero when we did this march. But we marched uh, from City Hall um, right to um, the, the housing project. And then uh, they asked me to, to speak and, and, and to have prayer, and I did that. And I remember walking away from that and thinking to myself, we, we've got to do much more than this. Reverend Brown was presiding over more and more funerals for young people. 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds. Remember, Reverend Brown was in his 20s then, not much older than the victims. This all came to a head one day at the Morning Star Baptist Church in Boston, when a funeral was interrupted by violence. A number of gang members were chasing a young man into the church. Pastor literally had to throw himself onto the young man in order to get them to stop stabbing him and kicking him and all of that. Uh, and they were doing all that in front of the altar, in front of the casket. They almost killed him. The, the, the young man actually did not die, but he was in really bad shape. There were more meetings, debates about big structural changes, housing, education, health care. All of those were important issues, but what we were saying was that, you know, look, there are guns out on the street, that's violent, and it's very clear that the police were not going to be able to arrest everybody to eliminate the violence. And so we started to walk in the four corner section of Dorchester. And at that time, it was the most dangerous neighborhood in the city. And we were walking out there from 10 o'clock at night to, you know, to at least one, two in the morning. And um, doing the same thing that I was doing in Cambridge, just going out, finding youth, making connections, trying to build relationships. But it was very clear that what I was doing was unconventional. I mean, you know, there were folks who thought I was going out of my mind doing it. I can't say that 
um, you know, it was always, you know, uh, a joy to be out there on the street. Sometimes it, it really did feel dangerous. Uh, on a, you know, on occasion, we, you can hear gunfire as we were walking. A couple of times when we were in the community, we had to hit the deck, you know, while things were happening around us. But, you know, by and large, I would say uh, it became clear that what we were doing was actually a key to, um, you know, uh, finding a way forward in the midst of all of this violence. These night walks would eventually be folded into a larger citywide effort called Ceasefire. Violent crime fell by 79% during an eight-year period. But what gets cut out of that narrative is the community effort of the many, many, many people who put their shoulders to the plow and and pushed uh, to, you know, eliminate violence and to make it better. It's sort of like in the same way the civil rights movement. I mean, my mother was a part of, you know, the marches and the sit-ins, but, you know, if I wouldn't have told you, you would have never heard her name. Um, you know, there are so many folks in Boston who were a part of, you know, eliminating and reducing violence in the community, but you'll never hear about them because they're the community mothers. They're the, you know, the uncles who cared about, you know, groups of, of young people to, you know, get them out of the community every now and then and give them different experiences so they could see that the world was larger than the six blocks that they lived in. It's those folks who made a difference. And I always say that whatever you do in terms of criminal justice reform and violence prevention, you need to see it as a moment of community empowerment. You can't come in with a community solution and not have the community involved in it and say that this is good for the community. The community has to own it themselves. The community has to embrace it. And that's the only way that you'll get real reform is when that happens. Programs like Ceasefire and other violence interruption programs can't succeed without the community's support. But there's a perception that clouds participation. It has a lot to do with how we talk about violence in African-American communities in the United States. One day, for example, Reverend Brown got invited by the New York Times to participate in a panel about gun violence. There were families from the Sandy Hook massacre, survivors of mass shootings, and gun rights advocates, all talking about guns in America. But then, you know, one of us, you know, who've had these inner city programs on anti-violence spoke up and said, you know, we're going back and forth about, you know, the NRA and all of this, but I got people who bring it in guns all the time in inner cities and we're dealing with this and we need help with this. And, you know, it was almost like an afterthought for many of the folks who were there. And so this issue of gun violence, if you really want to understand how it affects the human spirit, um, you know, talk to folks who live in the inner cities who deal with it every day. Reverend Brown says there's a prevailing wisdom that inner-city gun violence is different from the gun violence the rest of America faces. Yeah. I think what the disconnect is, is that there is this assumption that what people experience in the inner cities is somehow a result of their own choices or it's their fault. They have no idea or no understanding of how inner cities have ended up the way that they are, that it's not the fault of the community, but it's the way things have been structured over years. When you talk about decades of failed housing policies, I mean, decades of it, you talk about, you know, race and redlining and all of that. And then when you talk about poor educational institutions and how uh, schools in the inner cities are routinely underfunded. Some people call a kid at risk, but it's not a kid at risk, a kid that lacks resources. If you take the same kid and put him in a different environment, it's going to be a different kind of kid. Meet A.U. Hogan, 
Okay, and A.U. Hogan, uh, Chief of Streets Life Camp, Inc., uh, President of Baby Park Housing, Jamaica, Queens. Uh, that's why I'm. AU has been working in gun violence prevention in the South Jamaica neighborhood of Queens, New York, since the early 2000s. The goal right now is to stop people from shooting each other. And so we, we go after people who either are potential shooters or people are potentially uh, can be shot. And we try to change through theater is try to change the way young people look at things and giving them different opportunities. There's no music in school no more where we're at. You know, there's no more drama in schools where we're at. So we try to be the school that's no longer there. AU grew up in this same neighborhood, but he says it's changed a lot since then. I grew up in a town where there was, there was mothers and fathers at home. Uh, it was an area that people were looking for upward mobility. People went to work. Uh, people got along. AU says that after crack cocaine hit his neighborhood, things got really bad. Well, even my closest friends were doing, doing different things. The money of crack coming through the community was an interesting, interesting opportunity to not be poor anymore. And, in, and inadvertently, you know, they became millionaires for maybe three years. And the rest, you know, they were prosecuted. Some of them lost their lives. Mostly my closest ones didn't lose their lives, but they're still in prison and have been since maybe 80, 1989. He said there could be as many as 200 killings a year. And he brought up an interesting point. You can kill 100 people in the hood, and then they're going to consider that as a mass shooting. Why don't we call these killings mass shootings? That there was five people shot on my block, and there was five people shot on your block, we have to frame it the same way. Because you, you go out to the media, and media doesn't look at it. The media looks at it just a bunch of people of color shooting each other. But when a white person shoots 11 people, 12 people, it's a mass shooting. You know, not somebody just shooting a bunch of people. Remember the mass shooting in Gilroy, California last July? 21 people were shot. Only a day before, 12 people were shot on a playground in Brownsville, a neighborhood in East Brooklyn in New York City, which has struggled with gun violence for years. But the Brownsville shooting wasn't called a mass shooting. It wasn't talked about in the same way. Here's New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio on PBS. You had uh, in New York City in the Brooklyn neighborhood of, of uh, Brownsville, yeah. the weekend before this, a yeah. shooting and one person dead, 11 wounded. You waited several days before you call that a mass shooting. Yes. Why? Judy, uh, I have since said I understand why people in the community wanted to make sure that somehow there was not a different value given to one of these tragedies in one kind of community versus another kind what of What do you mean by that? Meaning, I think the fear in the Brownsville community, first of all, I went out there the next morning and folks were first and foremost concerned that the whole community not be painted negatively uh, because of the acts of a very few. We don't know all the facts yet, but they appeared to be members of a local gang. Um, I didn't want to in any way add to the negative impression that people were worried about. On the other hand, some voices came forward and said, we don't want to be undervalued. We don't want that, uh, a shooting that affects black lives to be seen as less important than some of the other shootings, for example, on some of the college campuses. And I heard that point and I recognized and I said, that's fair. I will refer to it as a mass shooting, even if the, even if the motive may have been different. The mayor made sure he stayed very careful about saying it was a mass shooting. There's a different kind of resource that comes behind a mass shooting. You're, you're aware of that. And there's a different kind of funding and support that becomes when someone says there's a mass shooting. There's a different standard for gun violence in black versus white neighborhoods. The common framing is black on black crime. When I see the media make a statement about black on black crime, it reminds me of how far we have come, but how far we have to go. This is Kayla Hicks. She's the director of African American and Community Outreach for the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. I wanted to help and change the narrative and make sure that people were fo focusing on this is a public health narrative and not just as, oh, those black people are shooting everything up and the baby mamas, are, they should get off of welfare. And just having that ignorant conversation that we hear nationally, that it's us, it's our fault. Kayla sees the root of a lot of gun violence in the communities where she works as a question of resources. 
these communities can get a gun quicker than they can get a job, quicker than they can get social services, health care, uh, diploma, like everything is um, difficult to get but a gun. And, and that's probably the worst conversation that I have still to this day because people seem, seem to have the conversation and then they don't do anything about it. It's hard for Kayla to look at moments in history, like the crack cocaine epidemic, and now the opioid crisis, and not see a double standard. I watched the uh, crack epidemic, you know, just ruin families and generations and nothing was done but criminalization. And then I, I got a chance to watch the opioid crisis start where the whole world stopped because it was impacting white people instead of black people. And now that became a public health crisis that we needed to take care of. So Kayla is focused on building leadership to demand those resources, empowering local communities to have a greater voice in policy discussions about gun violence. What I do for the the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence is to make sure that communities of color that are mostly impacted have a seat at the table, not forced, not taken, but invited and welcomed and are able to contribute to the policy and legislative conversation. And what we developed is a program called Engaging Impact Communities. And uh, that program specifically recognizes that we have to engage communities of color in the work to reduce and prevent death by gun violence. One of the programs Kayla oversees is called Education in Action. That's where she met a woman named Margaret Eady. Margaret Eady, uh, I absolutely adore her. That She was my first, um, well, my second uh, individual that I met in this space, in this work. Her son was murdered. And in her words, you know, when I met her, she was in a space of where she just didn't want to live anymore. But Margaret found a way out of that dark place through advocacy. When I met her, we began to talk more about what policy and legislation meant, what um, elected officials' uh, roles were and what their responsibilities were, what our responsibilities were, what the power of people could do. And she began to start to dig and research. And before you knew it, she knew more laws and bills than I did. She could track legislation better than me. She went from the corners of some of the um, hardest and most uh, impacted communities to the halls of Congress where she sat in protest and got uh, arrested. And we, we were happy to bail her out because she understood from the corner to Congress is a conversation that could literally change lives. And when people in these neighborhoods are successful in beating back gun violence, there can be other problems. Here's Reverend Jeffrey Brown again. Something was happening when people would experience the success uh, in places like Oakland, for example. Um, you know, they would see this reduction in violence and then this phenomenon would occur where, you know, developers would come into the community, but then the folks who were pushed out would not be able to afford to get back in. And a lot of the folks who do the work are community residents who you never really hear about, but they work very hard in order to make their community better, only for them to be pushed out of the community as, you know, um, as so-called gentrification would happen. So Reverend Brown founded an organization called My City and Peace. It works with developers to help people stay in their neighborhoods after they've helped make it a better place to live. And so that organization works with developers to find ways to keep the anchor residents of a community, you know, embedded within their community as the community improves so that they could reap the benefits of the peace that they've worked so hard to create in their neighborhoods. This is a great example of the kinds of blind spots people have around gun violence in neighborhoods of color. You might not see an obvious connection between affordable housing and gun violence prevention, but that's why it's so important to have voices from these communities represented at the table. Education and employment are also at the root of gun violence. These are core issues for organizers like Anthony Smith. He's the executive director of a program called Cities United. 
Cities United has big goals. Cities United uh, is trying to achieve uh, a, a world where all of our young people grow up in communities that are safe, healthy, and hopeful. Our big goal is trying to make sure that uh, it's to reduce the homicide rate of young Black men and boys uh, by 50 percent by the year 2025. Anthony was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. The city roughly divides on east-west lines. White folks on the east side, Black folks on the west. And you can see the differences, right? If you think about the different zip codes, there's a 7 to 11 year life expectancy difference. And when you think about the income, you think about access to ownership of uh, housing, to cars and transportation, those neighborhoods, the east and the west, uh, are very different. And Anthony saw both sides. He grew up in West Louisville, where his mom had family. But when he was a teenager, they moved across town. Better opportunities, right? I think mom wanted us at a better school, wanted to be in a a more, you know, I'm putting quotes up, safe neighborhood. And just the American dream, right? You always want to move up uh, if you can afford it and move out. Uh, And I think that's part of the issue that we're also dealing with is that a lot of folks who could be helpful to the communities have moved out of the communities uh, just because they had the opportunity to. So uh, I think it's both ways. So I think mom remarried, saw an opportunity, and took it. But Anthony struggled with the move. I dropped out of school in the 12th grade, uh, and I dropped out because I was, one, very disconnected from school from the 6th grade through the 12th. Uh, And by the time I got to the 12th grade, I didn't have enough credits to get anything done. I would have been there probably another three years. Anthony says there's some changes he'd like to see in how students of color are taught. I mean, I think there's a number of things, right? One, having people who look like me that I can identify in the school building. Two, teaching curriculum that I could relate to. I didn't find, you know, I would tell folks, I was just talking to folks the other day, uh, I didn't know anything about the Harlem's Renaissance until I was about 24, 25. And it's a movement that I think a lot of young Black kids and kids of color could relate to, and authors and musicians and artists that they could, connect to in different ways, but it's just not taught in the school system. Anthony had jobs since he was 16. When he dropped out of school, he got a job at Chuck E. Cheese. He worked his way up to assistant manager, but there was one problem. You had to have a GED or a high school diploma, so I went back and got my GED at like 21. That set Anthony on his path to becoming director of the mayor's office for safe and healthy neighborhoods in Louisville, and eventually Cities United. A big part of my purpose is to make sure kids who felt disconnected or not connected to schools had some of the same opportunities I had to then move forward, right? Because I don't think, I think kids always need a second, third, fourth, and fifth chance, but they also need people to help point them in their way. There was one more story Reverend Brown told me. So very last question, and thank you for being patient with me. Um, I read that you once tried to rap a sermon. What did that <laughs> sound like, and how did that go over? Um, <laughs> I did. This was during. You, you have to understand when I was when I tried this rap sermon. It was during a time that you know rap was becoming really prominent. I should say rap and hip hop were becoming you know, like uh, the music to be heard, you know, within the city. And so I tried to do this rap sermon. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I did it, I, I, I had some confidence. I mean, you know, I had words that rhymed and it just sounded good to me. At the end of the service, um, I had a young man wait until everybody you know left the church so that he could talk to me and so he walked up to me and he literally says a rap sermon huh rap and i said i looked at him and i was like yeah yeah i said what you think about that and he just looked at me and said don't do it again rap and i was like okay <laughs> but there is a part of that story that i that i don't usually tell and because a young person said to me afterwards, he says, don't, don't, don't do it again, Rev. He says, if you want somebody to rap in your sermon, ask me to do it and I'll get up and I'll do it. For me, it was a lesson that, you know, it's not something that I can do alone, but I, I can do it with someone and, and together we can make a difference.
I think this story sums up a lot of what we've been talking about this episode. You need buy-in from the community if you want your message to resonate. That's why it's so important for more voices like those we've heard this episode to be involved in the solutions to gun violence. Over the last couple episodes, we've talked about some of the new constituencies who've joined the gun violence prevention movement, moms and kids, veterans, and healthcare providers. They each have their reasons, much of which has to do with the toll they've seen gun violence take on their communities. But for many, this has been a relatively new development. There are communities who've been living with violence for years. And now that there's a table to gather around and take action on gun violence, it's important that they aren't crowded out and have a seat at the table. I think the role of leaders of color and young people of color, young leaders of color, is crucial in dealing with the issues around gun violence. The day-to-day experience of dealing with gun violence is really crucial for any larger effort to try to understand what's around, you know, um, what we need to do as a society around gun violence. There's a young man who was one of the survivors of the Parkland shooting in Florida. His name is David Hogg. You know, I met with David in, I believe it was in September of last year. He's a student now at, at Harvard. And he reached out to me because if you really want to understand gun violence, you really need to understand the inner city context. So he reached out to me and said, you know, I'm, 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 I need to learn. I'm trying to educate myself. In the next and final episode of this season on gun violence, we'll hear from David Hogg and Tia Amoya Roberts, two survivors of the Parkland shooting, about where we go from here. That's next time on American Diagnosis. American Diagnosis is brought to you by Just Human Productions. Today's episode was produced by Zach Dyer and me. Our theme music is by Alan Best. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. If you enjoy the show, please tell a friend about it today. And if you haven't already done so, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. You can learn more about this podcast, how to engage with us on social media, and how to support the podcast at americandiagnosis.fm. That's americandiagnosis.fm. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is American Diagnosis.